So I just wanted a bit of scene setting really and talk about what really excites me about this project. Obviously, as a, as a Ashfield business owner and Ashfield resident, you know, I'm particularly interested about what impacts our community and the wider community of, of, of Mansfield and the, and the surrounded area and spreading out into, into Nottinghamshire and then, and then nationally. Um, so I'm just going to do a little bit of scene setting about why I think this project has, has got in, in importance and, and why it is something that will help us drive uh, the business community forward into the future. Let me start the slide, please, Steve. Thank you. Seamless. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, so um, people may have seen this report already, but when I read this report in 2017, which is from the Social Mobility Commission, State and Nation report in 2017, that looked at all the um, districts within, within the UK, of which there are 324, and took, looked at um, potential hot and cold spots for social mobility, and, and you know when I, when I say it, gave, it was a it was a um, sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. That's probably an understatement. When you look at uh, Mansfield and Ashfield are tenth and eighth respective for cold spots of social mobility in the UK. Um, that you know for, for for somebody who's been born born in this part of the world, that makes me feel you know really really sad. Um, and, and it is something that I have I've banged on about and trying to champion uh, for a long time now. So I see this as a project as a way of driving that social mobility up. For people to want to be social mobile, to me, they need to be inspired. And this project, if it doesn't inspire people, they have no heart. Next start slide, please, Steve. So <clears throat> as employers, we, we, you know, we, we all hear, um, and we've all heard for a long time about the importance of STEM-based subjects. And we don't stack up particularly well nationally in terms of getting young people interested in STEM based subjects. So having a science centre where we can inspire young people from an early age, from primary school age and then through into secondary school, to show them that how science can impact their lives. So whilst it is a planetarium, planetaria, and I've got the, I've got the plural right over Steve. Planetariums. Planetariums. Yes, we've had this debate <laughs> long at heart. Um, uh, We'll also have the ability to, to, to show science in a really exciting and inspirational way. Um, so I think you know, the, the key stat, particularly for me, particularly within the UK, that young people are often in doubt about their ability to succeed in STEM. STEM. 62% of 60 to 70 year olds in the UK, well, that subjects like science and maths are more difficult than not non STEM based subjects. And that's from a recent Engineering UK report about educational pathways into, into engineering. And I think the little snapshot I put at the bottom, the, the second paragraph, really interesting in that um, whilst girls don't see it as a, as a career option for them, actually girls who take STEM outperform boys. Um, and, and seeing as 51% of the population are, are female, you know, if we don't attract all, all both males and females into STEM-based careers, then we're missing out on a big big part of big trick so again I think this, the, the science centre planetarium to me goes a lot would go a long way to unlocking the, that, that interest in STEM um, locally and regionally. Thank you. So again um, I talked about the um, social the issues around social mobility so the other big challenge for us locally in, Mans in Mansfield and Ashfield is around job displacements so Centre for Cities reports 2018 looked at the 80 largest conurbations within the UK um, who were at risk of job displacement to the, due to the rise of automation and artificial intelligence and unfortunately Mansfield came out bottom. So 29% of the jobs within Mansfield were at risk by 2030. Now I, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist so I always think that you know, those jobs are at risk. There will be jobs with the different types of jobs and I think those jobs will be more STEM based jobs as we have to service the needs that artificial intelligence and automation presents to us. So again, I think this is, this is a big part of the jigsaw of why having a science centre on our doorstep is really important. Next slide, please. So if, if, we, if we look at manufacturing, I think traditionally people would, well, people I've spoken to, traditionally think of the West Midlands being the powerhouse of manufacturing within the UK. But if you actually look at the East Midlands, 11.9% of jobs in East Midlands are in manufacturing and it's the highest percentage of any region within the UK. So we, we, we are a manufacturing base and we've got potential risk of job displacement due to rise of automation. So we need to do something to get 
get those young people who are not necessarily interested in STEM, interested in STEM. And again, I think the Science Centre, to me, goes a long way to address that. That's why I'm pleased, Steve. But it's not just all about getting kids interested in STEM. You know, I, I know from, from some work I've been involved with, with the Chamber of Commerce, how important visitor economy is to our region, and to any region in the UK. Um, and if you look at Nottinghamshire County Council's uh, strategy, economic visitor economy, one of his strategy, 2019 to 2029, and this was obviously written pre-COVID, so it'd be interesting to see what sort of impact that COVID has on as on the visitor economy, but the aspiration by 2023 to grow the visitor economy by 5%, um, with an additional 1 million visitors, creating 742 jobs, um, 57.5 million um, additional economic impact, and 18 million additional GVA. Uh, but to, for, to have a good visitor economy, they have to do good things to visit. And I think, you know, particularly in this part of the world where the, there aren't a, a plethora of, of interesting places to visit. Having having a good facility like this is, is key to driving people um, to visit the Ashfield and Mansfield area. So that's, slide. that's my last slide. So I think I just want to just try and make the case there why we think it's not just about building something for the benefit of the members of the of the society. It's about the potential impact that I can have on our economy locally um, and within Nottinghamshire and nationally. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to Steve Wallace, uh, who's the project manager for the, um, the planetarium project, who's going to talk to you a little bit about the history, and this is when it gets really interesting now, um, and, then, then, and then leading to what we think the future would look like. So just I'll keep, you. keep talking, I'll keep Mark, talking. because uh, my I'll presentation's I'll, starting I'll, in the wrong place. Yeah, I'll just sing <laughs> you a song, which is not good for you to hear. Um, now I, I think when I, you know, so I, I, you know, I've lived in Mansfield uh, initially all, all my life, and not latterly Ashfield, and I, I've been dri I've been driving or being driven past or driving past the the the, obser the um, observatory for most of my uh, childhood and adult life, um, and it, I think it's always been an interesting asset to the community. Probably something that you you know, we, not a lot of people have took advantage of it. As Steve will talk to us in a, little, in a, in a minute about the um, types of businesses they get already and how we can attract more people. So I'll let it to Steve then. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Martin. And thanks for filling in while I reset my slide presentation from the point where I tested it before. So um, you've, you've heard from Martin. We're, we're also actually attracting interest. Um, from the media as well. So there was a little bit on the radio this morning about this and, and we're going on the radio Nottingham again later on today just to try and spread the word. So um, hopefully that will attract even more interest than we're already getting. Um, so let's get the presentation to run. Uh, so great, this is the order I'm gonna go through today. I just wanted to start up front by thanking the, um, the businesses and individuals who've been working with us so far because without their help, um, we wouldn't have been able to make the steps that we've made uh, so far. I was then going to go through the history of Sherwood Observatory because I think that's an important piece of the jigsaw and uh, that leads us into the, the outreach that we're doing at the moment and it's really um, the feedback we get from that outreach that, that is demonstrating the need to produce these extend, extended facilities which is the planetarium that, that Martin's mentioned a couple of times so um, I'll go through that. And then as Martin's mentioned, what this is really about is a, is a call to action, uh, both in terms of actual money, because we need money to do this, and in terms of just general support to spread the word and, and get even more people interested in it. So that's roughly what I'm going to go through. Uh, so I wanted to start just by mentioning our supporters. Unfortunately, I haven't got time because we've got so many to, to go through each of them one at a time and say what they've done. Uh, but the one on the left is, is the businesses and not the universities you can see who have been helping us um, all on a pro bono basis all that. So thank you to those. Uh, the ones on the right are where we've had direct financial input to do things like the feasibility study. So the uh, Heritage Lottery Fund, uh, Ashfield District Council and the Architectural Heritage Fund. I did just want to say a couple of thanks um, to two of our supporters in particular, just because it, it's more relevant to the presentation I'm giving at this moment. So first of all, Block Digital, because all of the images of the new facility you'll be seeing uh, as I go through the presentation were created by, by Block. And um, 
as Martin was saying, if uh, that doesn't get you excited when you see those images and you see the animation at the end, then, then quite frankly, nothing will. Uh, the genesis of the design of, of what I'm going to show came from some work that we did with Nottingham University last year, uh, where they uh, paid for two Nottingham for two architect student interns to work with us, and it's their designs that Block have turned into the, uh, the, the the images and the animations that you'll see. But as I say, everyone else who's on that page has uh, played an important part in getting to where we are now. Um, we also established uh, a project board to bring the, the skills to bear that we need on this. Martin chairs, as he's mentioned, uh, and you can see there we've got representation from education, um, business in the form of Paul Humphrey from D2N to Colin, who's uh, being our technical host today, who's the um, planetary manager at Think Tank in Birmingham, and Caroline Taylor, who's uh, been doing some sterling work as a fundraiser for us to, to help us raise the, um, the, the money we need to do the design work and to do the, uh, the capital build when we get that far. So um, hopefully uh, some of the people on the call and some of the people who will tell about this call uh, will be equally interested and equally inspired and uh, they can lend their weight to, um, to, to help us move on to the next steps which I'll come on to. So just starting with the history of the observatory, um, it was started by uh, Mansfield and Sutton Astronomical Society, or, who are having their 50th anniversary this year. Uh, unlike uh, a lot of people who form an astronomy society, um, they didn't just want to limit their ambition to buying small telescopes and standing in a field, they wanted to actually build a physical observatory. So they bought the land that the observatory is now on, um, and started building it in 1972. Uh, it was all voluntary effort as it remains to this day um, and it took them until about 1986 when they were ready for the observatory to be physically opened. And before recycling and circular economy was a thing, uh, because they didn't have any money, um, uh, necessity was the mother of invention and they built the entire observatory out of recycled materials. Uh, that includes uh, making the uh, telescope themselves. And you can see in the bottom right there, an image of them polishing the mirror that uh, goes into the telescope. And you can see them there on that small hexagon in the middle, uh, making the roof of the observatory dome uh, without uh, any due regard for health and safety, as, as was the way in, in the 1970s, I think. Um, and this is the observatory today. So that image on the bottom left, you can see is our main telescope. So that's our pride and joy. It's a 24 inch reflecting Newtonian telescope. Um, and uh, for a long while, that was the biggest telescope in the UK that members of the public could just sign up and go and visit and, and get to look through. And it still is either equal biggest or, or nearly the biggest telescope that people can go and do that. And um, when we get visitors, uh, you know, that's one of the things that makes them go wild. And as we extend the, the, the site to what I'm going to come on to, then we want the, the new planetarium to have that wild wow factor as well. And unlike uh, the telescope, the planetarium will be unaffected by the, the bad weather that we often get around here because you can make clouds go away on the planetarium screen. Uh, and it, I think it signifies the, um, the hard work that the LEN members put in because the, the astronomer Royal came up and opened the observatory in 1986. What we're really about to this day is, is outreach, and this chart just shows uh, the outreach. I've chosen 2018, 2019 financial year because the last financial year that we just came through was quite badly affected by the coronavirus outbreak, so that wasn't really representative of the numbers we typically get. So the green bit of the donut on the left is our, our total visit numbers in 2018, 2019, and then the, the right hand half shows how those numbers are broken down. So uh, we're really popular um, with the Cubs, like, uh, Scouts, Brownies, Girl Guides, um, and we help them get their astronomy badges. So um, more than half of our visitors are kids, which speaks to the point that Martin was raising about uh, getting people inspired to do STEM. Uh, increasingly, we're getting uh, school visits and we also go out to schools. Uh, and then we have open events where people can just turn up on the evening uh, and look through the telescope, get interesting talks. Uh, and on a clear night, we can get between 200 and 300 people turning up. And, and we've been a victim of our own success because the only complaint we ever get is that we couldn't get in because it was too full. And these new facilities will, will go a long way to addressing that. Uh, we also go off site and do outreach. So this image here 
is just an example uh, of an exhibition we put on at Mansfield Museum last year over the summer to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the moon landings. Um, and uh, as you can see there, it is possible to fake landing on the moon. So um, if NASA would like to get in touch about their moon landings in 2025, they know where, where to go. Uh, I don't actually believe the first ones were faked, by the way, just in case anyone thinks I'm being serious. Uh, we also attract professional astronomers uh, to give talks either at the observatory or local schools. This example uh, is, showing, oops, is showing Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell, who uh, famously in the 1960s discovered uh, pulsars. Um, and so, so she came along and, and, and talked to some school uh, sixth form and GCSE students on our behalf. And we also get out to, to festivals. And what you can see in the background there, uh, just behind me, is a specially adapted solar telescope where we can show people views of the sun and you can see solar flares and uh, sunspots. And I have no idea what it is I'm trying to explain with my hands like that. But it, it must be something to do with this one. Uh, we've also gone even further in, in outreach. Um, we have one of our members who uh, emigrated to Hong Kong and he's trying to replicate the outreach we do with a similar sized observatory in Hong Kong. Uh, we've also became part of a project with the James Webb Space Telescope. So that's the successor to um, Hubble and it's, it's a lot bigger than Hubble. Uh, that's a, an image of the mirrors on the, on the top image there. Uh, and we've been asked to help with the professional team to uh, do some of the public outreach to, to demonstrate the benefits of that telescope and design it's going to be doing. So I think that's a, a good tick in the box uh, for the sorts of things we can do. And going back to the STEM agenda, you know, we're going to be given some materials by the professional team that we can use in demonstrations and, and try and get that uh, element of excitement and connection to the professional astronomers and professional space scientists. Um, a lot of the research actually says that the thing that inspires people, going into a planetarium is fantastic and you get the wild wow factor, but what actually inspires people is talking to people who are themselves inspired by this stuff and talk passionately about it. So uh, that's one of the benefits we can bring. So on to the expansion plans. Uh, this area uh, that you can see in orange there was some land that we bought a few years ago. Um, and on top of that land, you can see there a derelict building. And you just about see some die back in a circle around that building. And any archaeologist will tell you when you see vegetation die back, it's a sign that there's something going on um, under the surface. And indeed there is there. So if you go down through that hole in, in, the, um, in the building, uh, in the middle of that circle, this is where you end up. And where we are now is inside a, a Victorian water reservoir that was built in the 1880s uh, as temporary water storage for the local uh, community. So water would be pumped into that, it'd be stored there, and then it'd be pumped out and fed back down the hill again to the community. Uh, this will just give you a bit of an idea of scale. Uh, a brick vaulted arch structure about five and a half meters high, 23, 24 meters diameter with these uh, cruciform shaped uh, brick pillars holding the arches up. Re remember what that looks like because you'll see it, what it's going to look like uh, in a few slides time. So what we want to do is turn that uh, reservoir into a science discovery center, essentially a visitor center with some teaching spaces uh, where people can come on and learn about science, technology, engineering and maths, uh, or to just have a good time as part of the visitor economy and have a planetarium sitting on the roof of that reservoir. So the first thing that we did uh, was to conduct a feasibility study and, and a consultation. Uh, and that was the money that was paid for by Ashfield, uh, the Heritage Lottery and uh, the Architectural Heritage Fund, as I mentioned before. Uh, so we gathered some visitor feedback. So in terms of what we do now, we either meet expectations or, or we, we're better than their expectations. So it demonstrates we can run stuff like this. Most people would like to, to visit again. Um, we asked them if they would like to see a planetarium on site and would they visit that? And virtually all the people said that they would like to do that. Uh, and interestingly, planetaria aren't just about astronomy these days. They're basically high definition hemispherical projection domes that you can project anything on. So, um, you know, I've seen all the STEM subjects demonstrated on a planetarium dome and artistic installations uh, as well. So there's a whole range of stuff you can do with these. It's not just limited to astronomy. Um, we talked to schools. Um, and I won't go through them all, but the examples you can see on your screen are just some of the feedback that we had from, from schools, saying how, how they would feel that that would add to the uh, curriculum. 
and um, bring something different to their learning experiences. Um, we did a quite a large consultation going out to local shopping centres and online and we overwhelmingly got a, a positive uh, response from it. Uh, we went to uh, all of the schools in Nottinghamshire and the schools in this half of, of Derbyshire and we had 84 schools saying they'd like to bring classes with, with five maybes. Uh, now I know it's quite a challenge to convert all of those into visits but, but obviously the intent is there and the interest is there. Uh, we have a lot more information in that consultation which will help us design the experience so most people would like to visit more than once. Uh, we have a very good age range of people. This excludes the kids who come as, uh, as part of the uniform groups in the uh, Girl Guiding Association and the Scouting Association. So these are essentially family groups. Um, and most people say that they, they'd come as um, you, you know, a mixed range of groups either on their own as family groups or, or as formal group visits. So we've got a good handle on the sorts of uh, the people who would like to come along. Um, it's not just me who says Planetaria or Martin who says Planetaria can um, encourage people to go on STEM subjects. So I just wanted to show this little bit of video uh, from Louise Harrer, um, who um, is, is a senior physicist, uh, um, well, she's been at various places. Uh, and this was an interview she did uh, as part of Armour Observatory and, and Planetarium, but, but the, um, the thing applies, it's only a few seconds long. We were wondering what led you to the world of astronomy. Um, I think it was by accident. It definitely wasn't planned. So, I mean, I think many children do, and I was certainly one of them. You were fascinated by space, and my primary school trip to the planetarium was a memorable one. And that's, I, I think, the planetarium is really important in that way that it gives you the excitement of looking up and seeing what's what's there. Um, I think when I was in school, I didn't realise you could really get jobs in in astrophysics or in space science. So I, I wasn't, you know, it wasn't a drive for me at school because I didn't know somebody from Lurgan could do that. <laughs> <laughs> so that just demonstrates the potential. Now I'm not remotely saying everyone who comes to the planetarium is going to become a senior physicist and, and, and run a multi-million and research institute but um, you, you know for everyone like her there'll be lots and lots more people who um, you know do a bit better at school go into engineering subjects science subjects and um, you know follow through we might even get the occasional astronaut we have to remember that Helen Sharman's only from uh, Sheffield so you never know so um, what will the centre be used for um, well for a start, what we do now, except more of, so we won't be turning people away. Uh, a school visits programme. The thing is about astronomical observatories, they kind of only really work at night. Uh, planetarium and visit centres work through the day, so it'll be easier to get schools to come along. Uh, the design's taken into account feedback that we had from schools about what sort of experience that they would be looking for. Uh, and as I mentioned a few minutes ago, there's all sorts of community uses, so there's exhibition spaces. Uh, I know. Um, the planetarium in Newcastle, they do weddings in. Um, the last time I went to a planetarium conference, there was a music musician created um, a moving light show um, to, to fit his music and show that on the planetarium dorm as well. So there's lots of different things that these can be um, used for. Uh, community cinema is another one, for example, um, and corporate hires as well. So if, if uh, organisations are interested in having somewhere slightly different to have one of their corporate management team away days, then, then we could use it for that. Um, also, um, we've been talking to universities about it. Um, there is potential to, to use these as big data visualisation systems or, or design caves, but a lot of university research projects now that are, are funded by the research councils come with a caveat uh, that they have to do some public outreach in exchange for that money. So what better place to, to use as outreach and displace some of that data that we've been generating than a, than a local planetarium in the area. Uh, just showing some uh, business plan numbers. Uh, so at the moment, uh, we have 3,000 visitors a year, which is, is peak given the facilities. As I say, we're turning people away. Um, it's all run by voluntary effort and essentially the income um, covers our operational and maintenance budget plus some uh, limited amounts of money for uh, upgrades of equipment and stuff like that. Uh, 
and uh, we, we managed to run with a, with a surplus and with an operating uh, reserve uh, to uh, make sure resilience um, is something on board that happens. And we've actually needed that money this year, of course, because we've had to close uh, because of coronavirus, like a lot of visitor attractions have. Post development, we were quite modest in terms of our uh, aspirations. Uh, so we think once opened in the early years, we, we've modelled it on 20,000 visits per annum, which I actually think is, is light when you look at other things in the area. Um, for example, that exhibition that we did at Mansfield Museum about the um, hollow moon landings, we got 12,000, nearly 13,000 people through the door on that. And it was the second biggest, uh, second biggest exhibition that Mansfield Museum's ever put on. Um, we'd have to have staff in this particular instance, uh, just because of the turnover of work, but uh, we have lots of people uh, who would still like to volunteer and, and you know, get to use the equipment as well. And on, on those numbers, um, given that we're looking essentially at grant funding for the capital cost, uh, we think that the whole thing will be self-sustaining in terms of being able to, to go on into the future at those sorts of uh, numbers. But as I say, we've, we've made fairly um, conservative uh, assumptions there in our business plan. Um, we did a, um, an economic impact assessment on, on the area. Again, fairly modest at that sort of turnover that I was talking about in the previous slide. At, at the moment, you can see the values there. Post-development, uh, we've even only assumed 15,000 visitors there instead of 20,000. So nearly 400,000 pounds in terms of direct tourism impact just because we're bringing people into the area. It works out at um, nearly seven full-time equivalents in, in the area by the induced spend that we have uh, and then a couple more for the construction work uh, and then pretty much all of that income we generate would be spending back in as well so that gets recycled back into the, to the local area yeah. so um, uh, I think um, you know if, if, if you are buying this as a commercial proposition those numbers probably wouldn't make too much sense but it's the wider impacts that are the most important one we've demonstrated it will sustain itself financially but what this is really about is inspiring people, encouraging children and, and adults alike, I guess, to, to have more of an interest in STEM, take up STEM subjects. Um, and also the, you know, the visitor attraction itself, just getting people interested in, in, in science and technology and how the world works. Uh, you know, when you think of some of the um, difficulties that have been recently in communicating uh, coronavirus data we really do need people who can understand these, these, these numbers and these data and, and present them in a convincing way so the the business uh, the, the 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 development plan is and i'll come on to the funding in a second is um detailed design during next year so that'll be building on the feasibility work and the designs that the students did and the animations that block have done uh secure the the capital funding um, and uh, tender the, the construction contracts and things like that during the first half of 2022, then start construction 2023 and uh, sorry 2022 and through into 2023, and then a grand opening uh, during 2023. Uh, that's with the following wind, assuming we hit all of our milestones, but um, that's uh, that's the target we've, we've set ourselves at the moment. Uh, so in terms of funding, the big pie chart in the middle there shows what our uh, capital cost will be of building this thing based on, on current estimates. And the smaller one shows our next phase, which is uh, in heritage lottery term, the development phase, uh, which most people will know as um, DL design and planning application phase, which is, as I said, the next phase that we're just about to, to get into. So we think the capital cost is somewhere in the region of four and a quarter million. Uh, and the design cost, because that incorporates all the visitor attraction stuff as well, is about £225,000. Uh, we're in discussion with uh, two funders uh, for uh, more than three quarters of the capital cost. I can't really say too much more about that at the moment, because one of them in particular uh, that has asked me not to uh, go into too much detail. Uh, but, you, you know, we're, we're in quite advanced discussions with two organisations for a chunk of the money. So, um, you know, we've still got uh, the thick end of a million pounds left to go. And, and that's one of the things why we want to get more, more people interested and spread the word so that we can start homing in on, on the remaining funding. Um, the design, uh, we've been talking to the National Lottery Heritage Fund, uh, and we think we've got those interested 
in, in funding the, the detailed design. Under their terms, they would pay 90% of the design cost and leave us with 225, sorry, leave us with 22,500 to uh, find ourselves. Uh, and we think we can find that uh, in a combination of uh, private donations, corporate donations, and um, some money from Ashfield Council, all of those different sources of, of support that's in the past. So where are we with that stage? Well, look, this little rocket there shows where we are on the £22,500 target that we need to achieve by Christmas. So currently we're a little bit over halfway, got about 10,000 to go. Uh, and that's really um, one of the things we need your help for. Uh, spread the word, get as many people as you can interested, point them in my direction. Um, we're looking for direct contributions for the remaining £10,000 by, by Christmas. Um, when we get into the uh, capital end of the things I've mentioned all, already, um, financial support for, for that. Um, all pro bono support actually for, um, for you know, some of the elements of the project that are involved both in the design phase and in the capital cost phase uh, because that's, that's as good as money really if we can get people helping us out on those. Uh, and for the design phase, our plan is to issue tenders uh, during November um, so that we can select our suppliers and we'll have that financial information ready uh, to go to the Heritage Lottery when they reopen next year um, to secure that 90% of the design cost that we're talking to them about. Um, if you want any more information on that, then contact me directly. My email address is at the bottom there. Or if you just want to give us some money, then uh, that web link there is uh, will, will take you to the site that we're using to, to collect donations. What I want to do now is just finish the presentation uh, on an animation. So what this shows you is what the new facilities will, will look like. And you'll recognize the inside of the reservoir um, when I show that. So I'll just let that run now. It, it's, it's only a minute or so long. So that's our ambition, uh, that's uh, some of the justification we have uh, for building it. Uh, we have one already in the virtual world, all we've got to do now is get one and get on and build one in the real world. Thank you. I'll uh, stop Thank you for sharing that. So hopefully you've all been suitably impressed with that because I'm, I'm always open mouth when I see when I see that too when I, when I see the the, 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 the um, animation and think about how it could how it could, this thing could evolve so before we open it up to questions um I'd like to probably open the questions by passing over to Mark Golby who's the uh, chair of Nottingham Manufacturing Network and um, Deputy Lord Lieutenant of Nottinghamshire to really um, give us his initial thoughts and then, and then we'll open it up to uh, to questions so if we can, if we can introduce Mark um, and ask him to uh, lead us into the questions please. Well thank you, thank you Martin and um, excellent presentation Steve and uh, considering you want me to say something Martin you've left me speechless actually with the, with the animation that was, it was excellent extremely inspiring and um, and even when you outlined to say you wanted me to say a few words and you outlined the project and I never thought it would be inspiring and ambitious 
as it looks. So uh, excellent work so far. So uh, now I know you, Martin, particularly, you're a strong and relentless advocate for promoting STEM subjects. Uh, and in that respect, I think both you and I are, are from the same mould, actually, aren't we? So, you know, I think we've both seen firsthand positive impact young adults with not just a keen interest in STEM, but educated to uh, or in STEM subjects can have on our respective businesses. So, uh, so, I, so I run a Nottinghamshire-based high-tech electronics manufacturing business for almost 20 years. And, and you know what, the recruitment of new engineers and technicians and software developers was always a challenge. Uh, but we found a way. Uh, we had to forge strong links with, you know, local further and higher educational institutes. And it always felt it was an uphill struggle to get the right candidate. In fact, to be fair, it's a struggle to get the candidates interested in what we had to offer. So, you know, pleasingly, however, many of the successful recruits into my business are still with the business and are currently having successful careers. And importantly, they're being paid well for it too. Um, and, you know, many of them have said that they never knew the scope of opportunity would be so broad. So I think it just goes to prove the old saying about you just never know until you try it. Although that was probably more my mother telling me to eat up my greens on the side of my plate when I was younger. Um, but ultimately, I think that is still the crux of the issue right now. I think, you know, the manufacturing engineering sectors have still a fundamental supply issue with STEM educated recruitment. So. Uh, one of my other roles, as Martin mentioned, is the chair of Nottinghamshire Manufacturing Network, uh, which is a trusted peer-to-peer -peer network of, of business owners and leaders. Uh, we founded it six years ago to champion the strength and diversity of, of manufacturing in the county. Um, and no surprise there that the, the attraction of the next generation of talent is the number one concern and priority for almost all of the 50 or so businesses that are in that networking group. So, you know, we really must find a way, mustn't we, to, you know, get more students to give it a try. Um, but having said that, businesses can't be exempt here. They've got to play their part to demonstrate that their businesses not only need new STEM talent, but can also offer good rates of pay and great career progression. You know, and I believe now seeing further detail around this project, I believe this project can be a really important catalyst for just that. Now, I also sit uh, as a non-exec director on the board of Marketing NG, which is uh, the place marketing organisation for uh, the city of Nottingham. And, and I don't need to tell you that Nottingham City is having to look really at how the city needs to be rethought and repurposed. You know, it needs to be revisioned as a visitor attraction uh, because quite frankly, the lockdown has turned our cities and town centres into ghost towns. So, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to take time, I think, to define and develop the vision, the new vision of the city landscape into something that people will want to flock back to, not just to work, to live, but also to socialise and importantly, to visit as a visitor attraction. Now, the reason I'm saying that about the city is that I believe Nottinghamshire as a whole has had uh, a really strong and popular tourist uh, uh, market for some time. It's an extremely popular destination. Um, but I don't think it's had the same challenges that the city is facing right now with public confidence. So I also think the timing of this project is also important um, to sit with what I hope will be, you know, already uh, a county that's very, very rich in tourism assets. So, so I'm extremely excited about this planetarium project. And I never knew what the, uh, what the plural was, but I do now for planetarium or planetarium. Um, and I believe, you know, on one hand, it's going to attract interest from young and old alike and create inspiring ambition for the STEM talent of tomorrow, which is much needed. And on the other hand, it's, it will be another quality tourist venue for the county. So, so they're my initial thoughts. And um, I'm really excited about what you've created so far, gents. And uh, I'm hoping we can continue that interest onwards to the, to the next goal. And in that respect, I mean, there's been a lot of information shared. Um, so I'd like to open up, if it's at all possible, to, uh, for anyone to ask any questions, which I can uh, happily um, direct to any of the uh, presenters. Oh, crikey, I've just clicked on yeah, the chat so, and I see everyone. Yeah, extremely so busy. Thank you very much, Mark. Yeah, everyone. Everyone. Really, 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 um, oh, no, yeah, you can yeah. tell you.
Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so thank you very much, Mark. I, I think that was, you, you, you summarised things really nicely there. Um, so we would like to open it up to the floor for, for questions. So people would like to raise their hand if they've, they've got a question to ask or type the question into the chat box and we'll try and get around uh, and, and answer all your questions. Martin, right, from the chat uh, from John Beckers, we have uh, someone wanting to volunteer and asking how to go about it. Okay, well that yeah. sounds like, like one for me. Um, <laughs> I, I guess the simple answer is just to uh, contact uh, me in the first instance and I'll, I can feed you through to the, to the right people. We have different people who organise events and um, you, you know engagement with schools and things like that. But if you get to me in the first instance, then, uh, then I can take it from there. Thank you. Are you summarising the questions in the chat box then, Colin? Is there any other questions? Uh, we've, we've had not so many questions. We've had lots of uh, very, inter very interesting people, uh, very nice comments. Um, again, with another question, have we thought about a person share, a uh, tiny slice of ownership to create income? It was like crowdfunding, but it could give that person, for example, unlimited access, an acknowledgement on a large plaque as a contributor to the project, but no actual shares in income another idea for fundraising yeah uh, the the short answer is no but uh, it, that will be something we can look into yeah yeah uh, certainly i would say as well extending that to, to businesses that are helping us i listed those businesses at the beginning uh, there is our an intention to put a a thank you wall up somewhere on the development to all of our uh, supporters We have, we've got any we've hands got, raised. Uh, we've we've got a physical hand raised by Lee Marshall. I don't know if I have the ability to unmute. I think I have. Yeah. The, you didn't the, say hands. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, my question is, there's actually more than one science going into this building. And I wonder, has that been thought about when considering the HLF funding? So there's the, the science within the construction engineering of the building. Uh, and how that uh, and any any passive design or sustainable design that might go into the building and the construction of it. And I wonder has that been thought about all those multiple different sciences and how they come together to create this one this one uh, overall scientific project, which may tie in lots of more lots of additional STEM subjects. If you see what I'm saying, rather than maybe just be restricted to uh, uh, yeah. the physics of um, you know, staring at the stars, for want of a better description. I think that's a good point. So yeah. what you're saying is the project in its own right is a is a STEM education source. Yeah, yeah I yeah, think we'd, we'd, we'd want to sweat the asset as much as we possibly could <laughs> in terms of the positive things we can get out of it. And I think that it's a good point. You know, I think I've seen some more detail about how it was how it was built, and I think it's, you know that's really interesting. You know, but again, let's let's think about how we can sweat the assets in terms of the the, the, the build of the planetarium, mm. um, and, and how we could communicate. As in, as into into what jobs are available for young people. I think that's a really good po positive point, Lee. Thank you for that. We'll, we'll certainly bear that in mind. I, th I think I would add, add to that. One of the things that we will be doing when it's opened is, is making sure we have a nod to to what its history was and where it came from. So the part of the exhibition will certainly be about the Victorian engineering and what it took to to build that thing in the eighteen eighties in the first place. We've also had another couple of questions. Uh, could we get any marketing material? For the pro project to pass on to potential funders or supporters is there somewhere that we can make that available uh yeah absolutely i mean uh, um we can either uh, well we can do one of a number of things we we can make the my presentation from this because it was recorded we, we can chop out the, the, the stuff uh, to edit appropriately and make that available as a presentation uh, I mean, I put the presentation together. Obviously, there's some live video on the presentation, so it would have to be a live presentation in that sense. But most of the slides were deliberately put together as a sort of perspective. So that's why they've got quite a lot of words on the slides. Um, so we can make that slide deck available to, to whoever wants it to, to share with people. And another question from Mark Subaru. In fact, Mark, do you want to ask a question personally? Uh, sure. Hi, um, uh, my name is Mark Subarau. Um I'm the president of the International Planetarium Society. Um, this was incredibly exciting uh, and watching that video and uh, 
I was really impressed with uh, both the quality of the research you've done uh, into like who's going to come to visit and what the site is and, and the future. Um, so it seems to me that uh, this has all the earmarks of a successful uh, um, project and, and, and particularly in, in my question um, in the chat was just around that is that 20,000 attendance seems very low. Um, for this kind of facilities, so uh, I, you suggested as much, Steve, in your um, in your presentation. But um, you know, I was just wondering if you had, I don't know, what what do you think you could really get? Yeah, we well, we deliberately put a low number in to prove that it would work and prove to ourselves that um, it would be a sustainable option, even at very modest numbers. Um, the planetarium itself, the 10 metre dome, I mean, you and Colin will know more about planetariums than, than I do. So that's a 60 seat uh, capacity per turnaround. So uh, I don't know, what, what's a typical length of a planetarium show, Colin? Probably, uh, I, I generally run about 25 to 45 minutes. That's kind of the average for a school public planetarium show. So, yeah. So uh, we, uh, we can do the maths. Sorry, Mark, the math. <laughs> so yeah, no, that, thanks for the observations. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really difficult to know where to pitch uh, the actual number of visitors because we don't want to overstate it and, uh, and then under deliver. Uh, one of the projects that we're, I'm, I'm actually kicking off on Thursday is a project with Nottingham Trent University. So they have an MSc course on uh, public communication of science. Uh, and that module, um, the, 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 um, the project that they're going to be running this year is, is around uh, the visitors to the observed, uh, observed in planetarium. So that will build on that um, public consultation that we did. Uh, so the plan is for them to go and set up in a um, local shopping area and do some demonstrations and um, get more visitor feedback and get more data on uh, you know, who wants to come to it and what they would expect when they get there. Um, and what types of visit they would like and all that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, by the time we get uh, through the next design stage and, um, and working up the visit attraction experience itself, as well as just the physical building, uh, we'll have a lot more data on, on visit and numbers and demographics and travel distance and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, wonderful. I just, um, since you mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the physicist who was inspired, um, by her visit to a planetarium. I just thought I'd point it out because, uh, you know, last yesterday, uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded and uh, Andrea Ghez, who was one of the awardees, I know as a child came to my planetarium, the other planetarium in Chicago. So I'm very proud of that. And I just, just wanted to, uh, to point that out. But, but if you work in this field, you hear these stories every, constantly, right? So many, so many, so many astronauts, um, professional scientists, engineers who talk about being inspired. And there is something definitely about the immersive nature of the planetarium that we're learning um, causes people to remember things better. Information that's presented in a planetarium is retained longer than the same information that's on a blackboard. Thank you. So do we have any other questions? Uh, we've, uh, we've, we've had a couple, one asking, uh, when, once we start, we'll get all the funding with the benefit of everyone here. Um, just thought I'd slip that one in. Uh, asking if we could do a time lapse of the build so that we could showcase it. Um, yeah. Other people look really looking forward to developments and knowing their children will enjoy it and offer of help working with uh, uh, NTU and if there's anything we can, if they can do it from Jeremy Haig. Um, but we've also another question from Gary Jordan, um, have VWNC, NTU, Seven Trent Water and companies like Lenny Group been pitched to all STEM associated and how are we promoting to the wider business group of the area? We're, we're not because this is the first time we've presented it. So yeah, they are, they are on our radar. Uh, we will be talking to people like that. Yeah, I think um, 
just to, to reiterate what Steve said, after, after this presentation this afternoon, we will um, send out the slides to everybody. We've got everybody's contact details. We'll send those, any, any links to it, Steve's email address and to the Just Giving page, or to the, it's not Just Giving, but the, the, the fundraising yeah, page. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll present that as well. But you know, this is just the start of the process. Um, there is an ask, and that <laughs> I suppose that ask is you know, we'd, we'd like people present to help us to to, to promote that within their networks. Um, you know, there's a really big ask if, if people do feel generous enough to make a donation to help us get across that line for that, however small it is, because for that for that remaining ten thousand pounds for the phase one funding, we would greatly appreciate that. Um, and also, we are on, you know, anybody who thinks they can provide any pro bono support for us in any way, we'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. And I, uh, Fada, do you have a question? I did, sorry, I would have raised my hand digitally, but I can't find the button. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, can I con congratulate you, Steve and Martin, on the, on the progress? It's been a few months since I've kind of dropped in to, uh, to, get, a, to, to get to see what's going on. It's an amazing 3D update of the, um, of the design. Um, so congratulations to you all and, uh, and for maintaining the progress on this considering the current climate. Um, what I thought might be interesting um, just to mention is that um, the work that we're doing it, uh, with the county and our local lab is particularly around the local industrial strategy and the recovery plan that uh, we're working on at the moment, particularly highlights innovation as a, as a key driver for the, for, the, for the area. And the uh, presentation that Martin did at the beginning um, around engineering and innovation, artificial intelligence, uh, and mobility as well is very much um, topical at the moment. And I think the, uh, the observatory and its wider context and its technological context and usage uh, fits very well into the, um, into the, into the, mm. the sentiment and the future of, um, of how, the, uh, how the local economy is looking to, be, to, to, to grow. And with that, um, with that in mind, I think, um, you know, we, we, we're doing all of this stuff with the intention of seeing further uh, investment into the area, particularly around these around these er around these subject matters. So I think um, I think you've got the timing absolutely spot on. Um, and it's not just the it's not just the excitement of the actual uh, project in itself um, and its uniqueness to this area, but it's also appropriate in terms of timing in, into the uh, into the local economy. Um, so I just want to congratulate you on that um, uh, as well. Uh, with regard to offer of support, I'd be more than happy to do any form of distribution for uh, within the uh, within the within the local authority district um, on um, on your um, on your initiative for raising capital around that. So feel free to put me on to um, onto, onto your list. Um, and um, I'll also have a route around see if there's any wider funding that you might be um, might be available for you. Okay. Thank you, Father. Yeah, it's good good to see you again. It's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we had a couple of comments that made made there about uh, trying to link it together with other other local visitor attractions to make you know make something of a, a day out or a weekend out. And they are all things we we're already talking about. We've had some initial discussions with Portland Trading College about linking it together with their. Uh, Adventure Zone, um, which is a great outdoor facility. So that that, that is on our radar, and we are we are we are thinking about how we could we could link this together with other attractions. Martin, can we bring John Collins in? I think John yeah. wanted to ask a question. Yeah, it's just an observation, really. Um, I didn't actually know we had a had an, a Sherwood Observatory, and I guess most of the rest of rest of Nottinghamshire doesn't know it either. So I think the the, the, the plans you've outlined are fantastic. I mean, just looking at a map of um, the region, we're not exactly endowed with planetaria anywhere close to us, are we? So yeah. we've got a really good opportunity, I think, to to flaunt this. And we don't; these kind of projects don't tend to get publicised that well. And that's perhaps where we can use, as Fardad says, the, um, the, the the resources of D2N2, the resources of the various boards um, we sit on to promote. Um, the project and also I, I'm, I'm a member I'm a, a trustee of the East Midlands Education Trust and I would guess there's probably a few people here who are either governors or trustees with various schools the school network is a real opportunity obviously for publicizing this and collaboration um, going forward but 
that, that old phrase, if you've got it, flaunt it. So let's let's start flaunting it. Um, you know, it's, it's a really inspirational project, and there aren't many of those around at the moment. Yeah, great. Uh, the reason why not many people heard of Sherwood Observed is because we were at capacity without having to publicise it, and we didn't want to be turning too many people away. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We're now at the point where we really want to do shout, shout about it off the yeah. off, from the rafters. Right. Uh, I think um, someone else had their hand up. I've, I've lost them. Yeah, we've got a question from Lee that, that raised his hand. Just a, over on on the design target. I think you've got ten k left to raise. Is that ten k in cash, or can some of that be uh, volunteer time? Um, it yeah, that's an interesting one. Uh, ideally, the ten k is cash, but um, the overall uh, design money that I'd highlight there, the two hundred twenty-five thousand. Um, that can be working kind as well, which reduces therefore the overall total in terms of cash and therefore reduces the amount of actual cash we need to raise. But um, the lottery do like to sort of see if you've got the ability to actually raise cash as well as um, support. But obviously if you know, someone was offering to um, help out on that, on that design phase pro bono, then that would bring the overall cost down, which would make them very happy as well. Okay, thank you. I think, uh, was it Dawn who had a question? Someone put their hand up? I can't remember who it was now. No? I think Nina Cameron, do you oh, want to say yeah. a few words? Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the, the invite to this. Um, my name is Nina Cameron. I'm the um, Planetarium Coordinator at Glasgow Science Centre's Planetarium, but I'm also the current president of the British Association of Planetaria, so slightly more local version of uh, Mark Subaru's sort of role. Um, we've had a couple of phenomenal presentations at the last two BAP conferences from the, the team at the observatory. We are really excited as an organisation to, to kind of see this project come to fruition and I'm just going to put it out there. I think it'd be a fabulous conference venue for the British Association of Planetaria. We'd be delighted to host a, a conference there at some point. And it was really to kind of reiterate what Mark was saying about these venues being valuable and important to the future because they are so memorable. That's that's kind of what makes a planetarium special is it's this immersive environment. And even before we've started the, the stargazing stuff, people walk into our dome and their first reaction is genuinely, wow, it's it's wonderful. And I think given where your planetarium is going to be in in a, a sort of um, a bit of an engineering marvel, I think you've absolutely got this wonderful resource that's, as you say, I think it's going to have a, a national impact. It's not just going to be a phenomenal resource for the local area, which it is. I think it's going to be a wonderful national uh, resource. So really excited to see this project come to fruition. Thank you. Mate. Thank you. Uh, look forward to a, uh, an update of the next conference by which time we, we should be well into planning. Any more questions? Is it in the chat box? So just as a way of bringing things towards a close then, so just to reiterate, um, we will we will send out um, the the email Steve's email and the link for the fund, fundraising page, as well as the uh, the slides that you've seen this afternoon. Um, please feel free to share it far and wide. I think as we've, as we've, as we've reiterated, this is the start of the of the process for us, and we've, we've been beavering away in the background up until this point, um, and and this is really where we, where we kick things off in earnest to bring this project to fruition. So I'd like to thank everybody for attending this afternoon. Um, hopefully you've, you've been equally, as, as impressed as I was the first time I saw it um, and we look to, look to uh, eventually by 2023 inviting you to the to the opening when we can meet face to face absolutely so, I don't know if you have you want to say Steve um, no I think I think you've summed it up there Martin uh, what we'll do uh, Colin mentioned at the beginning that we're recording this um, the society has a, a YouTube channel where we've got um, talks from uh, volunteers and talks from professional astronomers 
Uh, so what we'll do is we'll place this recording uh, on, on that. So that will be another link that you can direct people to if they want to get an overall picture. So as a way of winding up, I mean, I've always wanted to say this, it's a good night from me. <laughs> it's a good night from him. Thank you very much for attending. <laughs>